I do everything in my power to observe the law of Yahweh. And then they're standing there and they see somebody takes the Bible seriously. Somebody's not just got it sitting on their shelf collecting dust. Exodus chapter 22. We are beginning a new section today, or at least what I'm going to call a section. In my Bible, it's divided into two sections. And I thought, well, instead of just reading a verse a week, I'll read the entire section. Exodus 22, 5 through 15. This will be the first lesson in this particular section in our study through the book of the Torah, the book of the law. Let's read it. Exodus 22, 5 through 15, if you have your Bible. When a man lets a field or vineyard be grazed in and then allows his animals to go and graze in someone else's field, he must repay with the best of his own field or vineyard. When a fire gets out of control, spreads to thorn bushes and consumes stacks of cut grain, standing grain, or a field, the one who started the fire must make full restitution for what was burned. When a man gives his neighbor money or goods to keep, but they are stolen from that person's house, the thief, if caught, must repay double. If the thief is not caught, the owner of the house must present himself to the judges to determine whether or not he has taken his neighbor's property. In any case of wrongdoing involving an ox, a donkey, a sheep, a garment, or anything else lost, and someone claims, that's mine, the case between the two parties is to come before the judges. The one the judges condemn must repay double to his neighbor. When a man gives his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any other animal to care for, but it dies, is injured, or is stolen, while no one is watching, there must be an oath before Yahweh between the two of them to determine whether or not he has taken his neighbor's property. Its owner must accept the oath, and the other man does not have to make restitution. But if, in fact, the animal was stolen from his custody, he must make restitution to its owner. If it was actually torn apart by a wild animal, he is to bring it as evidence. He does not have to make restitution for the torn carcass. When a man borrows an animal from his neighbor and it is injured or dies while its owner is not there with it, the man must make full restitution. If its owner is there with it, the man does not have to make restitution if it was rented, the loss is covered by its rental price. May Yahweh bless His word to our hearts today. And may we receive this for what it is. This is not the word of man. This is the word of Almighty Yahweh. These laws are righteous and holy and just. Up to this date, I've preached through Exodus 20 and Exodus 21. And I assure you we'll continue in Exodus 22. We covered verses 1 through 4 in the last two lessons. We'll cover verses 5 through 15 in whatever time the Almighty allows me to cover verses 5 through 15. Might take a few sermons. Somebody might say, that's a lot of law. That's a lot of law. I say with the psalmist David, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119 verse 97. I remember growing up in church in Psalm 1 was a very popular memory verse. We had a couple, a beautiful couple, come down from Michigan to visit us not too long ago, Brother Dan and Sister Evangeline, and they too mentioned that Psalm 1 was a big memory verse when they grew up in church. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's how I learned it, because I learned from the KJV, right? And that's how it read. But it goes on to say that the blessed man is the one who delights in the law of Yahweh. The word law is Torah, teaching and instruction. We read law in English, but the Hebrew word Torah means instruction, guidance, or teaching. And then David writes, In that Torah, or in that law, doth he, the blessed man, meditate day and night. Day and night. I've learned over the past couple years about the word meditate, thanks to my dear friend and brother, Brother Sandy. He has taught me that it is the Hebrew word Haggah, and it means to think upon, to speak about, to ponder, to muse. 
it has to do with verbally speaking back Yahweh's word to yourself on a daily basis so that you instill and hide his word in your heart that you might not sin against the Almighty. His Torah is what we are to meditate on. His Torah is what we are to repeat. Haggah. This word is actually used in our Joshua 1 song. Remember this book of the law? That's the book of the Torah. Shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall think on it. That's Haggah. I think King James says meditate on it day and night. So Joshua 1 and Psalm 1 agree. So as I said, some people might say, Brother Matthew, that sure is a lot of law. But we're called in the scriptures to meditate, to ponder, to muse, to think on, to repeat, to verbally speak back the Torah on a daily basis. The righteous man does this both day and night. But we're not justified by the law, Brother Matthew. That's another one that comes back to me, came back to me recently. We're not justified by the law. That one gets thrown around a lot without context. Christians have misused that sentence so much that the misuse has become commonplace and the misunderstanding has brought about monumental chaos in churches across America. I like to say that verse has been cherry-picked so much there's no more cherries on the tree to pick. It's been taken out of context. And I think much of it began with Martin Luther's overreaction to Roman Catholicism's indulgences. You can study about that in the history of the Protestant Reformation. There were some good things that the Protestant Reformation brought about, but there were some bad things that have stuck with us as well. And Luther overreacted to Rome. I see a lot of preaching coming across social media. I see a lot of shouting. I see a lot of sweating. <laughs> I see a lot of pacing back and forth on a stage. But I don't see much, if any, exegesis of Holy Scripture. Expository preaching where you take verse by verse and you preach each verse, sometimes each word, as is necessary. What about where our Messiah said, make disciples out of all nations? Disciples are students or pupils. What about where He said, teach them to observe everything whatsoever I command them or command you? What about this book of the law? shall not depart from your mouth. You know, it's a true statement that we're not justified by the works of the law, but if you don't understand what that statement means in its first century context, you'll come away with all kinds of sorts of things. In context, what that has to do is with Gentile converts not having to convert to Judaism in order to have their sins forgiven. That's the primary meaning of you're not justified by the works of the law in first century Galatia. They did not have to go through the ritual conversion process in order to be justified. Justified is a fancy word. It means forgiven of your sin. You don't have to, if you're raised a Gentile, you don't have to convert to Judaism in order to be forgiven of your sin. You're not justified by the works of the law. That's the context of the phrase. To use that phrase, no man is justified by the works of the law, to teach against keeping the commandments, like, for instance, keeping the Sabbath or eating clean or celebrating the feast or wearing tassels. If you use that phrase to teach against those things, it's a misuse of the phrase and it's a botching of the text of Scripture. The phrase also has to do, if you look a little bit deeper, even in the Older Testament, it has to do with keeping a few outward laws in the Torah and believing you're okay or you're justified. I checked my three boxes off, and I'm going to be okay. Isaiah 1 is a good example of people who were trying to be justified by the works of the law. They were keeping the Sabbath. They were keeping the feast. They were keeping the sacrifices. Yahweh said, I hate your Sabbaths, I hate your feasts, and I don't want your sacrifices. Why? Because while they were doing those things, behind the scenes, they were neglecting the weightier matters of the law. They were not taking care of the widows and the fatherless. It's like some people I've met, some people I know, who may have grown up in the faith. They may have been taught to serve Yahweh, but they've since left the faith. But they won't eat pork. Now, I'm going to put a piece of pork in my mouth. I know it's wrong to eat pork. Listen, if you've left the faith, if you've left service to Yahweh, you're not eating pork will not do anything in regards to your salvation. 
because you're not justified by the works of the law. You can't jump through a few hoops and think, I'm okay, Yahweh. And then judgment day come and you got a smile on your face and Yahweh says, no, no, no. No, no, no. You didn't serve me. You know how we're justified? You know how we're forgiven of our sins? By a living, breathing, active, working faith. An in-depth study on the Hebrew and Greek words for faith, Hebrew, imunah, Greek, pistis, it shows that the definition of the word is allegiance or loyalty. You're justified by faith means you're justified by allegiance and loyalty to the king. Faith includes faithfulness. When Abram believed the Almighty and it was credited to him or counted to him as righteousness in Genesis 15, it was not just a brain thing. It wasn't that Abram went, walked away and said, I believe you in my mind and that's where it stops. No, it was a full life thing. I pledge my allegiance to you, Yahweh. I want to be loyal to you. I believe, I trust, I have faith in your promise. That's how Abram was justified by a living faith and that's how Anybody else is justified by a living faith. And I'm supposed to be in Exodus chapter 22. <laughs> We're going to get there, I promise. But these are some of the thoughts that went through my head this week as I studied and prepared for this lesson. Brothers and sisters, the entire Bible is about walking in righteousness and doing good works. It is all through the Bible. I don't care what any Christian preacher tries to tell you that's different than that. The Bible is about walking in righteousness and doing good works. Blasphemy, some say. That's teaching works righteousness instead of grace. You're preaching works righteousness. Have you ever heard that one? I hear it all the time because I'm a preacher of righteousness by works. But you're teaching works righteousness. Do you know there's only one time that that phrase works righteousness exactly like that is in the Bible? Only one time. You know where it's at? Acts 10, 34 through 35. The Apostle Peter stands up and Peter opens his mouth and says, Truly I perceive that Yahweh doesn't show favoritism. But in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is acceptable with him. That's the only time. You know who that's about? That's about Cornelius. The Italian centurion. He was not an Orthodox Jew. He had no formal conversion to Judaism. But he worked righteousness and feared the Almighty and therefore uh, the Apostle Peter said because of that he was accepted before the Almighty. So much so that his prayers and his alms came up before Yahweh as a memorial. That doesn't sound like a filthy rag to me. Somebody said all our works, your best works are filthy rags. Hogwash. That's a misuse of Isaiah 64 verse 6. Your best works, Cornelius, Acts 10, come up to Yahweh as a memorial. And Yahweh smells a sweet savor and says, that's my son, that's my daughter. They're obedient, they're faithful, they're loyal. Cornelius' prayers and alms were not a filthy rag. They didn't stink before Yahweh. They were an honorable remembrance of his good deeds and righteous works. People think Exodus 22, 5 through 15 is a lot of law. Think that's a lot of law? Try our federal government. They're the ones who attempt to govern by regulation. Yahweh's law was never to be a law by regulation where you just heap and heap restriction after restriction on people until they can't breathe. There's no way that you could know every law on the federal law book. There's approximately 60 thick volumes of federal law. You all break them every day and you don't know it. I break them every day and we don't know it because they heap. Restriction after restriction after restriction on us. Some of them we've never heard, heard about. We can't keep track with all the regulations and laws that our government makes. Yahweh has about 613 laws at the most. That's not a scriptural categorization. That was a way that they were categorized in the Middle Ages by a man named Mahmanides. But they can be summarized in 10 basic commandments with their respective statutes and judgments. They can actually be summarized by two, love Yahweh and love your neighbor. So if you picture love Yahweh and love your neighbor up here, and then you've got chains hanging off of each of them, under the love Yahweh, you've got a chain that says, don't have other gods before me. Don't make idols for yourself. Don't blaspheme my name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Under love your neighbor, you've got chains hanging off. 
Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder, right? Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. And then off of those ten chains, you've got other little chains, the statutes in the law and the judgments of the law. You know, even in the 613 number, the bigger number, there are several that do not apply due to them being about the Levite priesthood and the temple. Maybe somewhere around 200 of them don't apply because of that. What I'm saying is that Yahweh's law is nigh unto us in our heart and in our mouth that we may do it. It's not too difficult for us, Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 14. It's not grievous. It's not burdensome, 1 John 5, 1 through 3. It's the many man-made laws. It's the federal government laws that are beyond our reach, that are too much of a regulation and a burden for us to do as they heap laws and we keep falling down because law after law after law when Yahweh's law is liberty. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. So you want to be a man of liberty? You seek Yahweh's precepts. The scripture doesn't teach, as I said before, the law is a regulation book to start with. The scripture teaches law as restitution. It doesn't teach law as regulation. It doesn't teach law as reformation. It does not teach law as redistribution. But it teaches law as restitution, which is what we've been learning in Exodus. That's the only way to justly govern any society. And we are so far away from that as a nation today. It's pitiful. It's pitiful. But we press on. And we do the best that we know. We do the best that we can. As individuals, first, as a congregation of believers, you know, if you want to change the world, you begin with yourself. You'll never change somebody else if you don't first work on yourself. When you work on yourself and you're a shining light, people are attracted to you and they say, I want to find out what he or she believes and practices because I want some of that. I want to be joyful like that. I want to walk in liberty like that. So we change ourselves, then we change our family then our church, then our local community, and we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You know, the question is not whether you have law. Everybody has some kind of law that they follow. Some people follow the state. Some people do. You don't follow the state, Brother Matthew? No. There's one lawgiver, Yahweh, who is able to save and destroy. Some people follow their popular ideology. Some people follow their self, whatever they feel is right and wrong. Some people follow church standards. Some people follow what the Supreme Court says. Every single person on this earth goes by some kind of law. So it's not a question of whether or not you have law. It's a question of whose law, whose law system will, be, will you be in submission to? That's the question. Not whether or not you have law. Everybody goes by some kind of law. Everybody. But whose law will you be in submission to? Which God are you going to follow? Who is your mighty one? If I talk to somebody about Yahweh's law and they balk and they say, Well, Matthew, it might be wrong for some people, but it's not wrong for me. They've just showed you who their mighty one is. They're following another standard of law. Whether it's their religious affiliation, their government, their church tradition, their state ordinance, there are gods and lords many, whether in heaven or on the earth, 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 6. Any time, listen to this, any time that you deny the beauty, the perfection, and the validity of Almighty Yahweh's law, you will without a doubt substitute it with another man-made law. You'll live by some kind of law in your life. I suggest you live by Yahweh's. It's perfect, converting the soul, Psalm 19, verse 7. Amen. Now, I don't want to get into this too much, but this is where Yahweh led me in my studies this week. As I was thinking and meditating about all of this, and as I kept getting bombarded everywhere that I go by the Pride Month thing that has taken place in our nation now, it is an abomination to Almighty Yahweh. The whole LGBTQ Pride Month thing. Do you know why all of that is protected now in our nation? Because the government says so. Because their God says so. And then they have determined that Matthew and you, 
are the wicked, evil people for opposing such things. They have their religion. It's the state. It's not Yahweh. They had their religion. It's the Supreme Court. It's not Yahweh. I saw somebody the other day. I saw something the other day. You see all kind of things, right? You get on Instagram to look at the photos of your family. I don't follow too many people on there. Just close family and friends, and then you get bombarded with all of this stuff. TikTok's even worse. I try to get on TikTok to help reach the younger generation, but it's a wild world, man, let me tell you. <laughs> if wild still means in today what it used to mean when I was growing up. But I saw somebody being interviewed, and they said they were gender fluid. Now, the person was obviously a woman or a female, I got in trouble one time in one of my sermons because I used the word female. <laughs> I quoted Genesis 1. In the beginning, Yahweh created them male and female. wasn't trying to be derogatory. The woman was obviously a woman. But she said, one day I can identify as a woman. The next day I might identify as a man. The third day I might identify as a lesbian woman. The fourth day maybe I identify as a certain animal. And she wore six different color bands on her wrist. And each one of those color bands, I can't remember the other two, but they stood for something that she identified as in her gender fluidity. My friends, that's a spirit of confusion. That's a spirit of confusion. Yahweh's not the author of that. And people are trying to push that spirit onto our little boys and our little girls. They're not old enough to drink alcohol or to drive a car, but if they say they want a gender reassignment surgery, we need to listen to what they say. That's what we're being told. I prefer Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> Mr. Rogers used to sing a song. I grew up watching him in the 80s. Boys are boys from the beginning. If you're born a boy, you'll stay a boy. Right. Girls are girls right from the start. If you were born a girl, you stay a girl. Only girls can be the mommies, and only boys can be the daddies. Everybody's fancy, everybody's fine. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister. A lot of people don't know that. but He's right in line with Yahweh on that, folks. In the beginning, Yahweh made them male and female. That's what Yeshua said. And therefore shall a man, a man, leave his, what, father and mother, not his father and father, not his mother and mother. A man leaves his father and mother, that's one family unit, and joins and cleaves to who? His wife. And they, who? Male and female, become one flesh. But, I might get a lot of amens there, but let's continue on. It's not just that subject, brothers and sisters. I know I said I was going to get to Exodus 22, but I'm telling you, the spirit of Yahweh, as, as Brother Steve said, the Ruach HaKadosh, <laughs> was moving on me this week. Somebody asked me after the service, who was that Ruach that kept leading Brother Steve? I'd never heard of that person before. I said, that means the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Ah. Uh, they thought, man, I didn't know who was leading him to do this and to do that. We've got an entire group of modern day Christians who fight other things in the law like the Sabbath. Or eating clean. We've even got some people that think adultery is not that bad anymore. Bearing, fa bearing false witness. I could go on and on and on and on. They act like everything's okay because after all we're under grace. <clears throat> Let me pull out my grace card. I don't got my wallet on me. I don't like to have my wallet on me when I preach. I don't want them Federal Reserves touching my Federal Reserve notes touching my body, Brother Dan, when I preach. I could pull my grace card out. Don't worry. I can sin. I got my grace card. It's okay. For you're not under law, but under grace. Romans 6 14. Hadn't you ever read that verse, Brother Matthew? Yeah, I read that verse and I didn't stop. I started to read verse 15, the verse that comes after verse 14. It said, Should we therefore continue in sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God for. Bid. How can he who has died, for, died to sin in the watery grave of baptism not resurrect to walk in newness of life? How can we say we identify with the Messiah? That's where my identity is, with the Messiah. 
How can we see we identify with Him if we don't walk as He walked? If you say you abide in Him, you ought to walk even as He walked. 1 John 2 verse 6. And let me tell you something here. The whole LGBTQ thing, I can't say it even, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but that thing, that has crept in to Christianity. And do you know why? Because it's the inevitable outcome of saying the law has been abolished. That's where it started. It did not start with the LGBTQ+. plus. That's not where it started. It started with some preacher standing up before his congregation and saying, we don't have to keep the commandments because Jesus died on the cross. We're on this side of the cross now instead of that side of the cross. Does it make a difference which side you stand on that cross? It's the same Savior that you're looking at who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And he said, you're my friends if, if you do whatever I command you. You talk to someone who practices homosexuality and you try to witness to them. I do. I'm kind to everybody. I try to love everybody that I meet in the general sense of common grace, common love. But you see, if you meet a person like that and you see if they don't tell you, well, do you eat pork? You know, the Bible says you're not supposed to eat pork. It calls it an abomination. Do you wear mixed clothing? Do you keep the Sabbath? Do you observe the purity laws? Do you see if they don't say that? I know that they do because I've heard too many of them up to this point. They say that because they know most people who say they believe the Bible actually really don't believe the Bible. And Christians are fine with just taking a giant eraser, a spiritual eraser, and saying, oh, those things have been abolished, but... The law against homosexual practice has not been abolished. Do you know why they say that? Because Christians a lot of times don't mind condemning homosexuality, but they do mind upsetting their life with Sabbath and clean eating. People don't like you messing with their time. And Lord knows people don't like you messing with their food. Our gods have become our stomach. There's a text in Philippians that says that. Listen, people have a schedule and a person's schedule is their priority. They don't want to take a day completely off each week. I had a person one time say, that's my day. I can't take that day off of Sabbath. That's my day. <laughs> no, it's not. It's Yahweh's day. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. He writes songs for the Sabbath in the book of Psalms. People don't want to take a day off for Yahweh each week because they want to do what they want to do. It's the same thing with eating. Don't you touch my plate, Brother Matthew. People treat their stomach and their appetite like a god. I like to say they eat anything that won't eat them back first. They don't want anybody telling them what they can or cannot eat. Is this okay? Am I okay? Am I all right? I know we're not in Exodus 22, but this is the intro that the Ruach showed me this week. <laughs> this is the intro as I prayed, meditated, and studied my Bible. Listen to this. Keeping the Sabbath and eating clean are two primary ways you can show Yahweh, Yahweh, I believe you're sovereign over my life. I want to revolve my schedule around your appointed times. I want to revolve my menu around what you say to eat and not to eat. I'm putting that trust in your hands, Yahweh. I'm not sovereign. You are Yahweh. For goodness sakes, look at all the time and the food He gives us anyhow. He only asks for one complete day. He tells us to live holy every day, but He only made one day holy. It was the Sabbath. He says, I want one day for me. And He gives us six days to work, to have fun. Not that keeping the Sabbath isn't fun. I enjoy resting. I was laying in bed today. I got up from my sleep, drank some hot tea, Drank a glass of water, lay back down. I thought, I ain't got to do nothing today. <laughs> Phone's off, not worried about no calls, not worried about no jobs. If I lose a job, so be it. I love the Sabbath day. Then we come to the Holy Convocation for just, it's just a couple hours, just a few hours we meet, usually once a week. We do extra on New Moon and feast days, but usually once a week we're here for a couple hours, fellowship, two, maybe three hours tops. Is that too much to ask? That's all Yahweh asks. 
And he gives us all kind of meat to enjoy. I had a, a whole plate of meat the other day, beef, lamb, goat, chicken. All those are clean animals that he gives us to eat. And a clean diet is healthier anyhow than an unclean diet. Right, Brother Tom? It's not like he's taking away something good from us. He's not seeing something that's beneficial to us and taking it away and saying, no, Matthew, you can't have that. No, his commands, all of them are for our good. We sang it earlier in Deuteronomy 10 through 11. Every one of his commands is for your good. There's nothing you can start doing for Yahweh or stop doing for Yahweh that won't be for your good. But see, a rejection of these laws is where it began. That was a springboard for a rejection of the laws against homosexual practice in the modern day progressive Christian church. And I put quotes around Christian because you cannot practice sin unrepentantly and call yourself a follower of the Messiah. You can't do it. Such shall not inherit the kingdom. And the only way back, listen, only, all caps, bold, underlined, italics, the only way back is to get back to the book of the law. That's the only way back. To take texts like the one we opened up with, Exodus 22, 5 through 15, to read that and take it seriously and believe it and practice it and not laugh and say it's primitive, outdated, archaic. That was back in the old times. That's how they used to do things. We've learned better now. No, the only way back is to take those texts seriously and begin to apply them to our lives individually as a family, corporately as a body. And then, when one of those people whom Yahweh would rather see repent and live than have to die and be destroyed, says, well, you're hitting me with Leviticus 18, 22, but what about Leviticus 11, where it says don't eat pork or rabbit because it's an abomination. I look at them with love and kindness and say, you're right, I don't eat that. And when they say, do you wear clothing mixed with linen and wool? I say, you're right, I don't wear that. And when they say, do you keep the purity laws? I say, I keep them to the best that I can, the best of my ability. Some things I can't do because we lack a temple or a tabernacle, but minus that, how far I can go is how far I go. Do you keep the feasts? How far I can go is how far I go. I do everything in my power to observe the law of Yahweh. And then they're standing there and they see somebody takes the Bible seriously. Somebody's not just got it sitting on their shelf collecting dust, but they take it seriously. And they love the Creator. And maybe, just maybe, they miss something. And maybe, just maybe, we can welcome, welcome them with open arms into the assembly as they repent of their sin. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified. Such were some of you. Our delight is truly in the law of Yahweh. We meditate upon that law both day and night. Psalm chapter 1. We don't just quote Psalm 1. We believe Psalm 1. Now I'm going to say something here that will be hard for many people to hear. Because these messages don't just go to this congregation. They go out across the world. I get texts and calls. I get so many I can't even respond to them all. But I get... Text and calls from, from Ireland, from Australia, from India. I get people contacting me all the time. So this might upset some people. It might be hard for many to hear. But I'm not here to win a popularity contest. This is scripturally true. Somebody who claims to be in covenant with Yahweh, a Christian, that does not care about breaking the Sabbath is in just as much sin as a professing Christian who thinks practicing homosexuality is okay. I'm not talking about the world. The world will be the world. Somebody texted me the other day and said, Brother Matthew, did you see what they showed on TV? I said, no, I don't watch that garbage. I said, but it don't surprise me. Worldly people will do worldly things. That don't surprise me. Well, such and such sang a song to Satan. That don't surprise me. They don't worship Yahweh, they're of the world. I don't listen to what they're doing. I don't worry about that. The world will be the world. They need help. They need salvation. But I'm not amazed when they sin boldly. I'm talking about people who say they believe in God and the Bible. Sabbath breaking is just as bad as homosexual practice. 
Now, let me balance this out a little bit. I'm not talking about somebody who knows both of those things are wrong, but may be struggling with one or both of them. I get in trouble for saying this too, but I'm going to say it anyhow. We all stumble in many ways, James 3 verse 2. As long as you admit sin, confess sin, and strive to repent from sin, Brother Matthew is here to help you, be your friend, and pray with you to overcome all temptations. I have met people before who are same-sex attractive. But when you talk to them, they know that it's wrong and they know they shouldn't have that feeling. And don't anybody turn their nose up because a lot of men that I've met before are heterosexually attractive, attracted to women they ought not be attracted to. Hello. Hello. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look upon a maiden. Covenanted with his wife, see. Heterosexual sin is just as wrong as homosexual sin. Hello. I'm talking to you. So I've met somebody before who's same-sex attracted and they've cried to me and they've said, I know that it's wrong. I don't want to have these feelings. What do I do? And I said, well, the first step is what you're doing right now. You're admitting that it's a sin and that you want help and you want counseling. And Brother Matthew is here to help you. Same thing with the Sabbath. I've met plenty of people who know it's wrong to break the Sabbath, but they've been apart, of Yah apart from Yahweh their entire life. And they don't know how to start keeping the Sabbath without losing everything that they own. Because they may have to forfeit their job for the Sabbath. But they say, Brother Matthew, I know that it's wrong and I want to keep the Sabbath. And I say, look, I can work with that. That's pliable. I can help you. Let's sit down. Let's write out a plan. Let's pray. Let's ask for Yahweh to move. I can help people out like that. Don't judge people if you've never been in their shoes. We all have struggles with something. The key is, are you willing to admit where you struggle? Are you? Are you willing to admit, I struggle with this. I need help with this. I know I violate this commandment and I don't want to. Yahweh, help me. Yahweh, help me. Are you willing to work your way out of sin and into righteousness? I will help anybody who confesses, admits their sin and wants to repent even if they struggle. Well, I guess Exodus 22 will have to wait till next time. <laughs> I could start teaching a little bit on it, but I don't feel led to do that right now. I, hopefully this lesson has helped on a few different levels. Amen. I love you. I do. I love everybody here. Brother Tommy, we're so glad to have you, brother. When I met you at Passover, I could, I could tell you had a great spirit. Brother Tommy's been doing our memorization with, with us before service. and I love everybody here. I love to love and I hate to hate. I love everybody I meet. I did a job for a guy the other day and he couldn't talk without using the curse word. He cursed like a sailor, as they said. And I was just nice and kind and loving to him. And it's not me. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's not me. Yeshua says we're supposed to love our enemies. And I do. I pray for my enemies all the time. I love to love and I love everybody that I meet in a general common grace sense. But listen, there is a right way and there is a wrong way. And I am tired of bad preaching. That's the title for my sermon today. I'm tired of bad preaching. I thought about maybe I'm sick and tired of bad preaching, but that wouldn't fit into the kiosk there as you type it in. So we keep sick out. I'm tired of bad preaching. I'm tired of bad preaching. I am. You say, Brother Matthew, you seemed a little angry today. It's because I was. <laughs> and I was putting this sermon together and I was watching clips and trying to gather information from my sermons on Exodus 22. I throw my hands up in the air and put my head in my hands. And I said, I'm so tired of lollipop, gumball machine, sweet tart preaching, <laughs> glazed candy, sugar-coated preaching. I'm tired of it. 
brothers and sisters, it's sending people to hell. Yeshua says in Matthew 15, if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. Where do you think that ditch leads? To hell. Gehenna. I'm tired of bad preaching. Praise be to Yahweh, even if only a few, we've still got some good preachers in the land. We need to find one. It doesn't just have to be here. But as you listen and you discern, if you find a good one, listen to him. Listen to him. Pulpits across this nation are pandering to people's wants and desires because churches have turned into a business more than a ministry. They have. They turn into a business. People don't want to follow the only right way whose name is Yahweh. And it does matter what you call the Creator. I understand if you don't know any better, that's fine. But when you find out, when a person finds out his name and they know it, it's wrong to not use his name. It's wrong. Somebody says, well, you sound like a sacred namer. Ding, 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 ding. You got it right. I am one. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, sacred be thy name. That's what that means. And let me not leave this out as I close. Yeshua, his son, whose very name means salvation. Yeshua, his son, showed us how to do it. I had an old gray-haired man one time told me, he said, do you know what state Yeshua was from? I didn't know he lived in the United States. It was Melvin Pennington's dad, Roy. He said he was from Missouri. Because Missouri is the show me state. And he showed us how to do it. <laughs> well, he did. One of the reasons why Yeshua was the unique son of Yahweh, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is found in Hebrews 1. It says, because he loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. One of the reasons he was the unique son, nobody else in that class, is because he always loved righteousness and he never loved lawlessness. That's why he qualified to die a death that reversed the curse of the first Adam. Only a sinless man could have done that. He's our example. He's the one who told us, baptize them, teach them to observe everything I commanded. And let me tell you something. He didn't command anything different from his father. Him and his father walk in unity. They're echad. And he said, he prayed in John 17, make these one, even as we are one father. Yeshua never let the book of the law depart from his mouth. And he did Haggai both day and night. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall think on it day and night. Be careful to do what Yah tells you to do so that you will have good success. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, but stay on the narrow path. Be careful to do what Yah tells you to do so that you will have good success. I love everybody. Do you still love me? Amen. You got to love me if you want to make it to the kingdom. You got to love me. At this time, we'll do our testimony and prayer request service. Brother TJ will take over here. Um, may Yahweh be with you. Shalom.